Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bennett Geister. I am the CEO here at Hillcrest Hospital South, and I have with me today Dr. Jacqueline Duvall, uh, our migraine specialist. And Dr. Duvall, I guess I want to start by, uh, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about your background, uh, where you're from, and, and whatnot. Sure. So I was born and raised here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I attended Casha Hall, and I've done most of my training in medical school here in Oklahoma, uh, my residency at the University of Oklahoma. But I fortunately had the opportunity this past year to head up to Rochester, Minnesota, where I completed a headache fellowship at Mayo Clinic. And what was that when, with Mayo Clinic? Everybody knows about the Mayo Clinic. It's a wonderful organization. What was that process like? When did you make that decision that you wanted to subspecialize in headache medicine? Sure. So I, um, I fell in love with neurology during medical school. I love neuroanatomy. I fell in love, excuse me, with the intricacies of the brain. and. After residency, I decided to go out into general neurology practice, and it was really there that I fell in love with headache medicine. I realized the positive impact that it could have on individuals' lives, and that these patients are really debilitated, and there is a lot that we can do to help them. So after that, I decided I, I really wanted to focus in on treating headache patients. I spoke with my family because it was a lot to uproot everyone and move across the country, but. My husband was fortunately very supportive and um, he said, look, if you're going to do it, let's do it right. And so I had an amazing opportunity and I learned from some of the best headache medicine doctors across the country. That's a challenge to you. I, I've got to imagine, was it a tough process actually getting in to complete that fellowship at Mayo? It was. Um, it, it's a tough process in general, just deciding to move everyone in your family, um, but really it's a top program in the country, and so having that opportunity, you just, you don't say no. And what a fortunate thing to get to have you in Tulsa, Oklahoma, taking care of your community. Was that kind of always in your heart to get back to Tulsa? It was. So we, both sets of grandparents are here in Tulsa, and we, Tulsa's always been close to our heart. I think it's a place that people naturally are drawn back to. Um, and so it really was my purpose in leaving for Mayo Clinic that I wanted to serve the Oklahoma community. And so... I had the opportunity to stay at Mayo, but turn that down because because of that passion to come back and really help Tulsans. That's awesome. So let's get a little bit clinical here. I want to ask uh, just a very simple question. What causes migraines? What's their latest research out there on this? Yeah, so that's such a common question. And the answer lies in that migraine is a genetically inherited disease. So blue eyes, brown eyes, it's kind of what you're born with. Mm. It doesn't mean you ever necessarily have to have a migraine in your lifetime. It just means you're at a higher likelihood to do so. So I tell my patients to imagine a dam holding back water. Anyone could have a migraine in their lifetime. If stress levels get too high, they don't sleep well, maybe they get the flu or they drink too much alcohol, water spills over the top and they have a migraine. Mm. Someone with a genetic tendency for migraine has a dam that starts at a lower level. And so it may take fewer triggers or maybe no identifiable, identifiable trigger at all to send them over the edge. And then talk to me a little bit. I mean, I think it's a kind of a practical question. There's a lot of people that struggle with the symptoms and they're not sure. So if somebody is out there wrestling with when would I want to make an appointment with Dr. Duvall, what kind of symptoms would they have that would trigger that? Sure. So I start with the American Headache Society's recommendations that Really, if you're experiencing more than about four to six headache days per month, that's time to start seeking medical care. If it's interfering in any way with your day-to-day -day life, if you're missing work, if you're visiting the ER frequently, those are all reasons to start having a conversation with your general practitioner and saying, look, do I maybe need to see a specialist at this point? And I think too, Dr. Duvall, a lot of, a lot of questions are kind of what's that, what's that care pathway typically look like? Am I gonna go see my primary care physician first? Do I come to see you? I mean, what, what's your advice with that? Sure, so generally primary care would be the, the first practitioner that you would see. Um, oftentimes they will identify if someone's in the point of chronic migraine, that's 15 headache days or more per month. Okay. Not all of those are migraine days, so I have Many patients that tell me, well, well, sure, I have more mild headache days, but on top of that, I'll experience light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, nausea, vomiting. So our primary cares are very good at recognizing if headache frequency has increased to a certain point, it's time to start seeing a specialist, start starting 
the migraine medications. Gotcha. And then I guess a question too is if I go on Google right now and I do a Google search on migraine, I find more information out there than I know what to do with. So is there any particular site you like to go to or you would recommend for people that are researching this or doing that? That's a great question. The American Migraine Foundation has an excellent website with general patient information. They send out booklets, um, different triggers, ways to handle travel. They recently sent a post about um, managing migraine during the holidays. Mm. So really practical information found there. The American Headache Society is always an excellent resource, especially providing data and research behind that. What do you recommend in terms of uh, people? Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's out there as well on how do I prevent kind of home remedies whenever yeah. it starts to come on, et cetera. Are there kind of common things you talk to your patients about? So when I see a patient in clinic and we have identified migraine, we start with the basics of what is migraine and what do we do to treat it. And so. Migraine is treated in two major ways. We use as needed medications for when the symptoms are starting to stop a migraine attack. And those are very different than the preventive medications. Okay. And we have preventives beyond just prescription medications. So I'll talk with them about dietary lifestyle factors, common triggers that they may want to avoid, also dietary supplements that they can consider over the counter. Are there common things in terms of just lifestyle um, at home? Like what are those kind of, some of those common things you'll talk to about? Yes, so the migraine brain, I equate to the boring brain, meaning <laughs> that it really just wants to have the exact same pattern every day. So sleep cycles being exactly the same, waking up the same time even on weekend days, making sure that you're getting adequate restful sleep drinking enough water, overhydration, avoiding too much caffeine. So if you're on cup of coffee number four or six, that's more likely to trigger a migraine attack. There are certain foods, so we look at um, common foods include MSG, so foods with additives in them, nitrates, nitrites, tyramine, um, that can be in aged cheese or red wines. Um, so we'll talk about all of that, and I have a handout that I provide every patient with information. So, okay, so I've, I've made my appointment to come and see Dr. Duvall. What can I expect when I come to the office? Sure. So we are going to talk about as-needed and preventive medications at the forefront of treatment. If someone's experiencing more than four headache days per month that are causing a moderate degree of disability, they really should be considering a preventive medication. Okay. These come in five major categories. We have blood pressure medications, we use seizure medications, and we actually use antidepressants. Mm. And when pills are not effective or not tolerated if someone's having too many side effects, we have Botox for chronic migraine, and we have a brand new class of migraine self-injectable medications. And then Dr. Duvall, what do you do on your end? So if you see a migraine patient, what are the kind of things that you're looking for that you're doing diagnostically in order to understand what the best treatment regimen is for a patient? Sure, so every patient treatment is individualized. There are no two patients alike. So I commonly have primary care physicians ask me, well, what's step one or what's your go-to of this or that medication? But the truth is it's completely individualized on the patient the symptoms they're experiencing, their concerns for their lifestyle or what medications may not work as well depending on it, if they run certain hours that maybe they can't take medications that cause sedation or maybe they are in a position where they're speaking a lot and so some of our medications may find may cause a word finding trouble. Mm. And so, um, so every treatment plan is individualized to that patient's need. Before we even consider the treatment plan is the diagnosis and evaluation. So that's my job in asking the right questions, making sure that I'm not missing what's called a secondary headache disorder, where there's something identifiable causing the headache, as opposed to migraine or tension type headache, which is actually a primary headache disorder. So if I, if I become under your care, Dr. Duvall, what's the typical regimen in terms of how frequently will I come to see you? What does it look like from a follow-up perspective? Sure, so depending on exactly what we're doing, if we're using procedure treatments or if we're using medication therapy, will kind of dictate that frequency. So I have patients that I see as frequently as weekly, early on. There's um, what's called medication overuse headaches, where patients are using daily or near daily pain medications that could actually be worsening their headaches. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes during a period of medication withdrawal, I'll see someone in the cl clinic quite frequently to help them through that period. But with a patient where we're managing with medications, generally that first year they can expect to see me every three months. We'll adjust medications, make sure that things are tolerated. 
Um, and then we start spreading out the visits beyond that. And we see, uh, just uh, kind of from a treatment perspective, we see uh, Botox. It's used in a lot of different uh, varieties. A lot of people are familiar with Botox. How do you use Botox whenever you're taking care of migraines? Yeah, so Botox is a foundational treatment for chronic migraine, and it, it really revolutionized how we treat chronic migraine patients. So Botox is given every 12 weeks. There are 31 injection sites. They're given over the forehead, the side of the head, back of the head, upper neck, and shoulders. And we believe that it works in two big ways. So the most obvious way that we see it working is with relaxation of muscles. Um, that, that is what we see with someone who's contracted botulism, which is probably close to about 3,000 units of Botox at once. But beyond that, in the pain world, we see it work a bit differently. And we believe that it's reducing signal transmission between these pain fibers. And then I'm gonna ask you this too, when I have a migraine that is coming on, and people that experience migraines, they kind of know, they know when it's about to happen. Any advice that you would give to those patients whenever that is happening? So treat early. So migraine is like a fire. If, if we see the embers, we're more likely to be able to just stomp it out. Maybe with, with an initial over-the-counter pain medication, or depending on that patient, if they're having aura symptoms with their migraine, maybe we go straight to a migraine-specific abortive medication like a triptan. But if the fire is in the ember stages and we can stomp it out, we can be done with it. Once we've let it build, it can become more of a problem. And some of our medications may dampen the fire but not completely put it out. And then I guess another question I have is for those, especially those uh, folks when you're at, if you experience migraines whenever you're at work um, and you know that there are triggers that are happening at work, what kind of advice do you give them in terms of how to manage that? Because we all still have to go to work. We all still have things we have to do. Yeah, so there are a lot of work accommodations, um, and actually they're entitled to those through their employer. Um, but there are blue light filters that can be used if computer screens are a particular bother, if um, patients can have different lenses for glasses that can be helpful, also some sound protective devices um, if need be. I have patients that will use um, massage, um, personal massagers over their neck or even heat or ice during the workday just to help cope with different stressors of position. I encourage my patients that have a large degree of neck pain with their migraine to get up and move positions. We may also use, utilize physical therapy to help with cervical stabilization exercises, proper posture, those sorts of things that can be helpful in limiting some of the muscle tension. What are the most common too, Dr. Duvall, what are the most common kind of subspecialties that you will work with or in coordination with whenever you're taking care of these patients? Sure, um, so ear, nose, and throat is a common subspecialty we'll work with. I also work closely with OBGYN because I have many patients during pregnancy that may not know what's safe or effective that we can use. Um, we work closely with pain management and complementing Many times back pain will accommodate migraine. Um, some, those are some of the more common. And then if I'm a female patient in particular, because that's a good one, um, walk me through a little bit um, in terms of those conversations you're gonna have with them with regards to what's safe, what's not safe, especially since uh, there's such a heightened risk with pregnancy. Sure, so we really begin pre-conceptual planning. And so our questionnaire with any of our migraine patients includes are you planning pregnancy in the next 12 months? Because many of these medications need to be stopped several months before considering getting pregnant. And so, so it's very important to know that even six months down the road, if I'm thinking pregnancy, what I'm taking today could affect that. So we start with that initial conversation and then we, we delve into which medications are pregnancy class C, which ones are class, so pregnancy class B means that there have, no been, there have been no testing done on humans because that's largely unethical to do during pregnancy, but that we haven't seen any major risks or side effects. Um, class C is that um, there has been no identifiable risks during animal testing, and then class D and X would be off limits during pregnancy that, that harm has been shown. And so we talk about the medications that are for sure not going to be considered and then we talk about some and we begin weighing the risks and benefits of the detrimental effect that chronic pain can have on pregnancy with migraine um, versus the risk potentially of a medication being used. 
And I, I want to go back to something you said a second ago, which was super interesting to me. If I experience migraines, you had mentioned sometimes changes in diet or how much I drink or whatever it may be, can be some of those triggers that bring that on. Once I'm either on medication or I've got my care plan set up, are those, can I still eat and drink the foods that I want to eat and drink or is that something that has to be moderate how do you how do you kind of advise on those decisions so it all depends on the frequency of migraine so a patient that's having chronic migraine identifying clear triggers that are identifiable identifiable can be really challenging um, because the migraine is not just the headache we have a prodrome in about a third of patients we have an aura and we have a postrum and so many patients may not know when that actual migraine attack started. So they may be identifying a trigger with the pain phase of a migraine when in fact the migraine started hours to days in advance. And so if a patient, if we've used our medications and frequency has reduced where they're able to identify triggers, oftentimes if our medical treatment is working effectively enough, they may be able to eat certain foods again or or you know, maybe staying up late on a weekend night isn't quite as much of a trigger. Think of these treatments as rebuilding the dam. They're trying to make it higher so that it takes less triggers to send them over the edge. Now, if they're particularly prone to one trigger, they may not be able to eat that, or, or if they do, they may be subject to a migraine. Very good, and I wanna ask another question you said. You had talked about how migraines, it's genetic, and so, I'm a parent and if I start to notice or I start to have concerns that, that my kid is beginning to experience migraines, when as a parent do I need to start considering a decision to go in and see the doctor? That's a great question that I think it would still be the same. If these have become something that are limiting school, are causing any hindrance in even social activities, are really becoming more frequent with time, that's a reason to see a specialist to make sure that we're starting appropriate preventive treatment. So I've got one kind of uh, last question. It's kind of a practical question. <clears throat> I am interested in um, getting an appointment with Dr. Duvall. What's the most common route I should take? So patients can call directly for an appointment, but that does depend on insurance requirements for every individual. So many of our patients have a referral from their primary care physician, and that's always an acceptable way to get in. Okay, sounds good. Do have any questions from the audience? Okay, sounds good. Well, Dr. Duvall, thank you so much for taking the thank time you to very much. Uh, have a conversation with us <laughs> about everything that you do, some awesome things. Um, you guys can get in to see Dr. Duvall um, information forthcoming and, and thank you all so much. Have a happy holidays. Thanks. Thank you.